Hey ladies, so busy day here in the Homeschool Mama support group. I've got loads of different resources that I've left in um, the Facebook group or the support group here. And if you are feeling a bit overwhelmed because maybe you're a new homeschool mom or maybe you're overwhelmed because you're a uh, you know, homeschool mom for many years who's looking at all these resources, resources saying, there's just a lot here and I don't really know how to use it all. It just feels like too much then you're welcome to join me. Just book a, con or a call or really we're gonna just have a chat, a conversation on Zoom. I'll give you the booking link if you want to get it sent to you directly, but uh, book a call and we can chat about how I could serve you, what resources you might want to start with and what will really benefit whatever year of homeschool you're in right now. Because if you're a first year homeschool mom or you're homeschool curious or you're just new to homeschooling in general, then I have a specific resource for you. It's called the Guide to Your First Year Homeschool. I'm offering a paid support group, which means you'll have workshops and also support group alongside other homeschool moms that are starting their homeschool year for the first year ever. And you'll also have, paid or not, you'll have an access to every week have letters sent to you to encourage you and also answer your questions directly to your email inbox for your first year. But if you're not a first year homeschool mom and you're maybe second to fifth year homeschool mom, I have a special resource for you too. If you haven't already heard me speak to it, it's called Reimagine Your Homeschool Life. I'm really excited to share this group coaching opportunity because these are the things that when you could just say, hey, what do you think is the most important stuff to really focus in on so you can feel more happy in your homeschool? I would say there's three things. One is to de-school. The other is to figure out how to deal with your big emotions, your big emotions, also your kids indirectly. And the third thing is about leaning into child-led learning. So today I'm gonna to be talking about curriculum, a variety of curriculum and this just does like a drop in the homeschool room ocean that I have at the other end of the house. I have a lot of curriculum because I have homeschooled for almost a couple decades. My four kids, um, I've got three grown kids. My third daughter graduated this year and my, my son is entering high school this year. And if you haven't met me already, I'm Teresa. I'm the homeschool life coach in the Homeschool Mama Support Group. And I'm here to help you homeschool authentically, confidently, and purposefully. All three words that are sincere to my heart are part of the, the stories that I've learned throughout my life. Homeschooling's helped teach me a lot. Um, so what I wanted to share was not specific resources because you're gonna learn from me. And you're going to hear me say this a lot. I actually don't really like talking about curriculum in general because I know from my early years that I had this notion that there was one right curriculum, that there was one right way to homeschool, and I was looking for it desperately. I researched for two years before I homeschooled. I, you can read all my um, choices, my curriculum choices on my website, capturingthecharmedlife.com because I started writing about homeschooling within six months of homeschooling. So I've recorded all sorts of cool things, had zero intention in sharing it en masse or in kind of like a, a coaching way. That concept of coaching uh, formally only came up three years ago. Want to guess when? Actually, no, it was about six months before March 2020 that I had decided to um, share my book, which is on my curriculum list, but a curriculum resource for you and not just for your homeschool kids. Anyways, I wrote a book in my fruit orchard called Homeschool Mama Self-Care, Nurturing the Nurturer. And I wrote the book. I've actually written a few, but this one was published. And then I started a podcast on a lark to be honest, because I wanted to meet Julie Bogart, which might sound creepy, but it was actually true. And, and then I met a whole bunch of very cool people in the homeschool community. And I learned that I love podcasting in my closet. And I learned that it was a very useful way to encourage other homeschool parents. And so I'm in season six of the podcast. And today's episode dropped. It's all about homeschooling high school. Last week's homeschool podcast was about getting started with homeschooling. The week before was about kindergarten homeschooling. 
and and I love doing the podcasting thing. So I did the book, I did the podcast, I'd already been coaching informally, but then I actually shifted into formal offerings like our retreat, um, coaching in discussions on boundaries, discussion on overwhelm, our big emotions, reimagining your homeschool life, all sorts of different resources. So that's why I say, why don't you just join me in a chat and we can figure out what resource would be the best one for you to use right now. But that's homeschool curriculum for you. For me, I don't really like talking about curriculum so much because I don't like reinforcing the idea that there is one right curriculum. I genuinely believe you can buy any curriculum and use it in many different capacities. I think you could go to the library and not buy any at all. And you could share it in a homeschool co-op or you could do anything, but you could use resources, whether you purchase them or not, in varying ways. And it could be really beneficial. It could be interesting. You could learn from anything. Um, so I wanted to share a few of the things uh, in my homeschool room or in my homeschool closet, but more to look at them in a different way. So there is a resource that I have uh, that I lent out. It's called Well-Trained Mind. And I have to talk about this book because I think I have spoken publicly about this book many times in a not so complimentary way. It was the book that helped influence how I homeschooled, a very classical homeschooled focus. I really wanted to create a private school in my home that would perhaps outdo the private school that my two girls were at when we first um, had our family life. Our kids came out of school at about kindergarten and grade at the end of grade two. And so I think subconsciously I was really trying to compete with a private school. And the book was called A Well-Trained Mind by Susan Wise Bauer. And it props up my computer at present every time I have a coaching call. And, um, and that's about all at this point. It is a hefty book. It is a useful book. It is not a useful book if you're trying to do it to the letter of the law. And that is what I was trying to do. And it was exhausting. And it didn't work. And it didn't serve me and it didn't serve my kids long term. It did get us to do homeschool and I did make it happen. I do know how to do a very um, traditional kind of homeschool. You can see that in a lot of the posts that I share on my website. And I'm very familiar with curriculum. It has, it, uh, here's why I think it's useful for you. Or books that feel overwhelming in how they share planning ideas or ideas for enacting curriculum or routines in your homeschool. It gives you ideas. It helps you to feel confident that you can approach a specific subject or, you know, a different, I don't know, different writing activities or research activities, whatever, any type of homeschool subject or concept, you could find a way to use that book to help you know how to approach something. And that is I get a lot of ideas there too, but of course there's also Google, so you could also go to Google. But I think The Well-Trained Mind by Susan Weisbauer was a really useful book to help me feel confident in approaching all the subjects. Now, having said that, I am no longer a classical homeschooler. I've moved into a much more self-directed, education-focused direction. And that was with the help of another book that I came across. It was a John Holt book called Why Children Fail. And um, within a few months, I decided I was no longer going to tr traditionally homeschool. I brought one of my girls to Starbucks and said, we will never homeschool again. We will unschool. And so she was radically unschooled for six months. And I discovered children learn anyway. She learned anyway. She learned many things. We did a lot of traveling. There was no way that we weren't going to learn. And so it informed me that approach that anything that we do could be a learning opportunity. And that's why I like using the word learning opportunity instead of school subjects. But so John Holt's book was really useful. And, um, and now when I'm looking at these books, I see them in a whole different way. For instance, I don't know if you've heard of this book, The Evolution of Calpurnia Tate 
but it's a pretty, pretty amazing book, really, um, a character story. If you ever see that Newbery Honor Medal, that shiny round circle on the book in a library, it's won an award for a reason. Most read-alouds that you find anywhere in a book list or in a library really can be used as a way for us to use, um, you know, discussions on history. You can go in and you can say, okay, when was this happening? What time period was it happening? You could do a deep dive into that, um, high, or that history period. You can easily also, something that another piece of curriculum taught me, uh, five in a row is a type of curriculum where they read a storybook and it every day they dig deep into an element of the book. So if the book is talking about a certain geology or a different kind of biome or it's, you know, it has a setting that's in the mountains, then you can actually pursue a unit study or a deep dive into that particular biome. Or perhaps, you know, you can see the drawing on the outside here. I don't know what it's called. I'm sure there's a name for it. But if you wanted to discuss art, then you could do a deep dive into whatever kind of art you'd find on the book cover or whatever kind of art is inside of the storybook. If there's a discussion on something related to science, you could go into a deep dive on something related to whatever the science concept is. Um, or you could do history, obviously. This is, that's an easy one. So many possibilities, but you don't have to think of, you know, curriculum in the form of something that requires you to check off a book or a check off a box. You don't have to think of it as um, a learning outcome that is prescribed by the state or the province. You can think about learning beyond what perhaps a school would approach it, like a workbook or a textbook. You don't have to think curriculum equals workbook or textbook. You could learn in so many different ways. One thing that we did um, is use this globe. We have, as a homeschooler, we have a lot of globes. We have a lot of maps and all sorts of things like that. And sometimes we would just spin the globe and find a specific place and then decide to do a little research on that space. That was fun. In fact, I think my kids know more about geography, I think homeschool kids generally do, than a lot of school kids. I know that that's never 100% accurate, but on average, I think they know an awful lot about the world geography. If you haven't seen this book, it's called Everything You Need to Ace English Language Arts in One Big Fat Notebook. These are really amazing book options. They have all sorts of different topics now, and my son used a couple in the last few years, and something like this. Anytime you have a discussion on English concepts or you have a discussion on how to write a paragraph or how to sentence diagram or what are the different grammatical concepts, I think this is a book that's useful for you to learn that stuff. As a writer, don't think this stuff is all that important. I really don't. I'm with Julie Bogart on that one, that the goal is in writing is actually not to figure out how to sentence diagram or to figure out what the different parts of the sentence are or to figure out how to do a five point essay. Not that they don't have value. They probably will at some point, if not just to organize our thoughts, ability to communicate, perhaps to take college courses someday, but really in the moment, not a lot of writers are like, did I diagram that sentence correctly? Is it in the right grammatical format? Nope. You know what we're trying to do is communicate a thought in a way that's effective so that you care. And that's what we want our kids to learn too. So books about writing, books about grammar, books about anything related to that, I think should be used more in a a way of um, learning about writing, learning about communicating, so that you can help your kids understand it themselves, and then decide whether or not certain things have value. Sometimes, because the books, say like this one, are actually kind of pretty and kind of interesting, some of our kids actually really like doing workbooks like that. I've had ones that definitely didn't, and ones that did. And so if they do like doing those things and they're engaged in those things, or if you think those things are quite valuable, then it is a useful, could be a building block 
for learning more about different things in your writing development. But food for thought, sometimes the books we use in curriculum are actually useful for us so that we can learn what we need to learn so we can engage it with our kids. And that goes for math for me. I would suggest to you as someone that is not a strong, um, or I wasn't a strong math, or I wouldn't have a high proficiency in math way back in the day. Math, you see, for me, that was the one that I focused on. And I've said this before, that this is not my strong suit. It wasn't my strong suit, still isn't really. But I, until about the age of grade nine, that level of math, I'm pretty conf uh, competent. And it was mostly because of Steve Demi. I learned a lot of math concepts over the years. When I was homeschooling, you're gonna get the best education out of everybody and your youngest child. And it helped me to understand the concepts. But what I've learned over the course of time is that um, a lot of math concepts from zero to grade nine-ish, a lot of them can be learned au naturel. Some of them might be a little more challenging, but when you want to go into a grade 10 high school year, you can figure out a lot of things and you haven't, you haven't gone into school before grade 10. You can actually figure out a lot of basic math concepts before you get into grade 10 and you don't need to do it over the course of nine years beforehand. And that one was a bit of a, whoa, really? Is that possible that it doesn't have to take you nine years to figure out how to add, subtract, multiply, divide, percentages, decimals, ratios, geometric concepts. Anyways, there's more I know, but no. So that's just something to consider. It is possible to learn some of these things in a shorter period of time, but I used it for me, those math concepts, those math workbooks, so that I knew that my kids would be exposed to the things that were the most important things. Now, if you're a true unschooler, you might be saying to yourself, you know what, I'm good. I know they'll figure out what they need to figure out when they need to figure it out. And that level of trust, that level of faith, I think will be rewarded. If you've ever heard Judy Arnell talk about unschool to university, um, Judy Arnell is one of those authors that are on my homeschool mama reading list. And she is a uh, unschooled mom of five. I think she has three kids of her five that have gone into an engineering program and she never taught them math. She will tell you what I've said. She's not particularly proficient in high school math, and yet her kids are doing some pretty amazing stuff in math. And I'll tell you that I've had um, two of my kids for sure, maybe three of my kids that did actually quite, or were quite comfortable with math concepts, and they didn't need me to engage them in it at a high level. They actually could figure it out by themselves. That was a shock to me too. Of course, they had other, other resources and other mentors when they needed them. So again, another math concept where, or another resource that we can use for us to learn a little bit more. Here's another really interesting book, The Kitchen Boy, a novel of the last czar. There's a lot of books related to the last czar, that family, uh, the Romanov family. When you read a book, you can also watch the movie or have discussions. And I think those big juicy discussions that you have with your family members are actually extremely useful for uh, really learning about learning, learning about various topics. For instance, curriculum can be used as a resource for you to have big juicy conversations. And if you wanna test your kids over the course of time, you'll discover kids learn you'll know that kids learn because they can share back with you the things that are the most important things. I absolutely love this video, Where the Red Fern Grows. If you have kids that are sort of in the junior highest years and they are kids that are wanting more time with you, separate time, alone time, I would suggest that maybe find an evening a week where you just watch a video together, the two of you, and you can do a deep dive into discussing character and discussing plot and discussing the setting. And then you're covering literary techniques as you're doing it. Games, I've said it before, but um, games in ev every form, any form, no matter the game, can be a useful learning resource. You will learn things of all sorts. Um, with games and definitely keep your kids' attention. 
I pulled out this book, a friend, it's a music of the great composers, and it's a book that I really loved. I love learning about composers. I love listening to the music and sharing um, some musical pieces with the kids, even if I didn't know them, because I learned about them with the kids. I love doing this for a few minutes in the mornings. And my, my thought behind this piece is that perhaps this isn't your interest, but maybe you do have an interest and you haven't pursued it because you're like, I don't have time. Include it in your homeschool. You can learn a little bit every day and include it as part of your home education learning too. One of the best places you can find curriculum is actually at the museum or an art gallery. And that is where I found this piece. Some of the most, like the coolest things that I've found are at, um, like we did a lot of traveling. So when we went to the Colosseum in Rome, I picked up a few Osborne books. <laughs> like Osborne is at the Colosseum. Or, you know, this one is the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's where we were in New York City. And sometimes those are the best places to find resources. Let's talk language. This is called Ecoute Parlay. This is book one. And I found it to be a really useful exposure tool for language, um, specifically French, because I'm Canadian. I know that Spanish might be a super popular one for many of you, or I know some people are really getting into Mandarin, Russian, all sorts of different languages. But there are a variety of different kind of language resources. I found this one particularly useful because it was intuitive for me. And uh, I have some basic French knowledge. Obviously, you can't read this backwards, but it will discuss verbs and nouns. It'll explain how the, you know, all the grammatical pieces go together to make a sentence so you can begin to learn sentence structure in um, a different language. To me, it doesn't really matter what the language resource is that you use. At the end of the day, uh, like I really like Rosetta Stone. There's a variety of things you can just find on YouTube that are super useful. But at the end of the day, I don't think it really matters because if you're not second languaging your kids, if your kids aren't actually in the second language experience right now, if they aren't cross-cultural or somewhere where they're constantly exposed to someone speaking that language, they're probably not going to pick it up as well anyways. We did a lot of traveling, so we sampled many languages. Uh, when we were in Kenya, we, we uh, tried to learn Swahili before we went to Kenya, and uh, it didn't stick, but it did stick when I started ordering things from or asking to purchase things in the market, or when the kids were interacting with other kids, or you know, various real life scenarios. So I feel like um, language learning is a useful approach you know, if you want to build some basic knowledge bits into their brains, it can be fun to play around with language. I know my daughter, my third daughter is learning French in Duolingo right now. That was something that we were often using at different times, but second languages are usually learned well if you're actually in another culture or engaging someone on a regular basis. That's been my experience and yet the exposure is good. And what about books like this? This was one of my husband's favorites when he was a kid and my kids enjoyed it too. I have a kiddo that read Diary of a Wimpy Kid for many years. Can you consider that learning? Well, I know instinctively I go, uh, but of course, like there's always something to learn every time someone's showing up and reading and, you know, engaging something. And so I encourage you to, you know, maybe take a deep breath, just like the screen discussion about how much screen time is right for kids. I will not prescribe that. I don't think anybody can know for sure. I know that we tend to think that we shouldn't be on screens all the time. And we think that as adults and for our kids. So there's probably some truth to that. But is there a perfect number? And is there a perfect kind of literature for your child? I think if they're reading, that's really useful. That's a really useful tool to dip into all sorts of different genres, to maybe reread things that they really love just because it's a really comforting kind of lovely book. Just read if you can. And if your kids aren't reading or if you're challenged by um, your child not reading or you think something's up with your child and their challenges in reading, I know that the homeschool community and certainly me for many years would have said, it's okay, they'll be fine. And it might very well be true. 
And then there's also part of me that has learned from a few different people, educational interventionists, um, reading interventionists, that if you have the spider sense that something's not quite right, you might want to get an assessment so that you're at ease and also that you're giving your child a tool to actually learn the things, you know, get past their challenges and feel confident. And I actually in the Patreon support group in July 19th, so next week, I'll actually be having a chat with Sherry Jensen. She's a reading interventionist and she discusses all things learning challenges if you want to join that. I have a book called Flags of the World sticker book. This is from Asborn. If I were to sell any curriculum, it would be Asborn. Amazing stuff that they have. But don't discount weird gross things like horrible histories videos. Have you seen these? These are so gross. But they definitely teach history concepts, basic history concepts and math games. I remember seeing this at a homeschool curriculum or a curriculum vendor supplier, Math Attacks. I don't know if you're familiar with this. There's a bunch of different kinds of dice, bajillions of kinds of games beyond probably my skill level, or these little wrap-ups. you learning how to add, subtract, multiply, divide. The kids really like these. They have the answers on the back. And I think one of the benefits of going to a homeschool conference is actually going to the curriculum vendors and checking out all the cool resources that they have. And just learning is this something that I really you know when your hands are on it and you're actually flipping through it is it something that I can see myself using for six months nine months or maybe you just want to use it for a couple months and then actually asking your kids too do you want to use it I did that for a few years and it was I think it was an effective approach to do it because I really uh, got a better idea of what my kids wanted to do and how they approached learning and it didn't matter what we bought we would all tire out of whatever the curriculum was. It didn't matter what we bought. Eventually, we were bored by it or it wasn't as useful as I thought it would be. But I have come to the, the strong um, conviction that the reason curriculum isn't so valuable, the reason I won't encourage it, and I probably am not likely ever to um, become an affiliate per se with it because there's many good curriculum out there, but I don't want to push a particular curriculum because I think that our goal isn't to find the right curriculum or to choose the right philosophy, but rather that we are choosing a curriculum that serves the specific child that is in front of us. So we're committing to the bigger picture. The bigger picture is how does this help my child learn? Is it really serving my child? Is it really a useful tool for me? What do you like? What do the kids like? These are things that you learn over the course of time. It doesn't happen immediately. You'll never figure it out perfectly. You'll probably be like me where you have an entire homeschool room of resources and wonder what the heck you're gonna do with it all, except to show it on Instagram or Facebook. Um, I think that's about all that I wanna really share with you today. If you have any questions, throw them in the comment section. I'm happy to answer anything that you have. Certainly, I would say, as a last thought, is whatever you're choosing, use it, not because you bought it. Don't use it and use it up because you have to, because you bought it. That's why you don't want to buy anything if you don't have to, because then you can feel the freedom to not use it because you didn't buy it, so you don't really care that much. But if you buy it, then just use it for the purpose of enjoying a learning experience. Enjoying it not because you're checking off boxes, not because you found the right one, not because you have to do every last science experiment in that book. No, because it enables the learning opportunity for you and your kids. Okay, I hope you have a really great week and we'll talk to you soon.